Welcome, everybody. This is the uh, Stonebridge Press podcast, and today we are talking about Tokyo. And I'm here with Michael Palmer, who also works at Stonebridge, and I'm here also with Giles Poitras, who is the author of our forthcoming book called uh, Tokyo Stroll, A Guide to City Sidetracks and Easy Explorations. Uh, one thing about this book is that it was supposed to come out in August of 2020, that's heading on to about two years ago, and thanks to the pandemic, uh, we actually pandemic yes, but the real thing is that Japan basically closed itself down, went back to its early days of complete isolation from the foreign world. Uh, the last time they did this, it lasted for 250 years. Uh, it's only been two years to date, so hopefully they'll be lifting it pretty soon. And in anticipation of that. Uh, we have rescheduled uh, Giles Books publication uh, for November of 2022. So it'll be over two years since the book was first scheduled. And even so, Tokyo is still there. All the stuff is happening. It's still a great place to go. And Giles, through the miracle of uh, technology and communications, has actually managed to keep the book up to date we've adjusted phone numbers maps etc cetera, etc cetera. so uh don't feel like uh, if you buy the book now you're buying information that's two years old the book is still fresh and we're still updating it we'll update it till the moment we go to press and uh, giles also has his own uh website where he's uh, providing updated information new information i'm sure we'll get into that too so anyway uh, welcome, well, not, Giles. Not to mention the uh, digital version also. Which right, is right, right. Updatable. There will be a digital version, which will have a very cool map feature where you'll be able to uh, navigate yourself to all the places in the book using an online map feature. And Giles can, uh, can tell us more about that. So uh, welcome, Giles. Okay. Thank you. And uh, thanks for all your hard work keeping this book up to date. That must have been... Uh, really crazy. I, I should say the book has got how many maps is it? A hundred and forty? I don't know. I don't know. It's like <laughs> I, a, I've been thinking today of actually doing. I, yeah, I, I kind of lost track. But I, I mean, Giles was intimately involved in every aspect of it. So uh, thanks for uh, thanks for doing all that work and keeping it up to date. And uh, you're still working on keeping it up to date, right? Yeah, I'm about to do another check to make sure everything in the book is still there. Uh, we actually had two buildings disappear <laughs> the past couple of years. Uh, and luckily, there were great things in the same neighborhood we could just pop in as a replacement. And so minimal editing on the maps. Uh, the uh, Yeah, the book was quite a project. Uh, I originally had an idea of, God, wouldn't it be cool to do a guidebook to Taitoku in Tokyo? And I thought, I don't think Peter would go for a guidebook to just one area of Tokyo. So I better like mention to him I was interested in doing a book on Tokyo itself. And uh, that sparked an interest. I had, at that point, done numerous trips to Tokyo. Uh, one trip to the Kyoto area. All the other trips have been to the Tokyo area. You've been going to Japan for a, a very long time, right, Giles? I started in 2007. 2007, I went with friends. We lucked out and found a great place in Asakusa to stay at, and we explored the city. Now, part of our criteria, there were three of us, was walk around Tokyo and look at cool stuff, but we will not go out of our way to hit the big tourist sites. If we happen to be there, we'll check it out. So... I began to do research on places I thought might be interesting in Tokyo. And I was pulling up things from movies, from anime, from manga, from literature, and making a list and figuring out where they were in relation to each other. So with that, I would say, okay, here's one spot we want to hit. It's right here. What is near it that we also want to hit? And so I started mapping all that stuff out. Didn't have a smartphone, no no tablets, all that kind of stuff. So I had to use a print atlas. I would sit in a coffee shop. I would find a location we were interested in. I would find what was nearby. 
and then I would make notes. Okay, lots of trips, several trips with several friends. I've got a pile of notes. I said, I could organize this into something. So that's became the foundation for the book. Giles, it, it, in, in, before you retired, you were a professional librarian. Right. And so organizing things comes to you very, very naturally. Obsessively. Yeah. And, and actually, that's made you a wonderful author because you're very meticulous. And uh, in, in addition to keeping things organized, you keep things very, very complete. Uh, so, yes, that's – did you say – did you use the word um, obsessive and compulsive about – about that, yeah, yeah. yeah that's a pretty good way to do it. You know. <laughs> well, you know, and you were also, uh, this is not your first Stonebridge book. You mm -hmm. published uh, three books with us. You did two volumes of the Anime Companion, and then you did the Anime Essentials, and those books were almost like 20 years ago. But mm -hmm. I, can I assume, though, that the, the first interest you had in Japan was kind of going there to check out the kind of animation and culture scene as your interest had developed from watching lots of uh, anime over the years? Yep, very much so. Uh, because I kept hearing about places, about events, about personages. And these were things that were like totally below the radar. I mean, I'd been paying attention to Japan for decades before then. Not in a huge detail, but you know, going to see movies, watching documentaries and so forth. And before anime and manga hit the U.S., the average American's exposure to Japan tended to be very heavily literature, Zen Buddhism, temples, shrines, gardens, and samurai movies. Not too much else. Uh, and so anime and manga exploded it. And so a lot of the places I visited on that first trip and subsequent trips, which are in the book, are famous locations in Japan, but were not in the guidebooks. Well, and initially, the uh, Japanese government was very happy to keep its image one of cherry blossoms, Zen gardens, and and all the rest of it. I remember when uh, when manga first started coming out, you know, it, it was not coming out with the uh, with the blessings of the government. That's for sure. The Japanese right. cultural <laughs> ministry was kind of horrified to have its dirty laundry exposed like this. Yeah, but people like you, I mean, were instrumental in in making it happen, and that's still the case right now. I mean, if you go to Tokyo, there there are a lot of people who go there. They go to Akihabara. There's shops in Nakano that uh, you know specialize in uh, anime related merchandise, mm -hmm. and it's I mean, it's just huge. You can spend your entire trip doing nothing but that. Oh yeah, and Ikebukuro, of course, has a whole slew of shops, restaurants, coffee shops all oriented at female fans oh, you know? okay. so you know it's like a whole complex fans and then for live action movie fans there's museums uh famous film locations and all sorts of other things to go on and those i touch on in the book also right well before we get into those details uh, michael were you about to say something i was just going to ask if there was one location maybe that is very special to you um, when you go to Japan that kind of represents your interests? I based myself in Asakusa. And that happened largely by accident because on the first trip, I had no idea where to stay. Uh, if you searched online, they would invariably refer you to places in Shinjuku where the big hotels were or the not so big, close to the red light district hotels. And because I have a strong tobacco allergy, I had to find a place that was 100% non-smoking. So I did some searching based on that. I found a place in Asakusa that was like 3,000 yen a night. It's about less than 30 bucks a night per person. It was traditional. Uh, no frills. Toilets down the hall, showers downstairs, but very clean. And we discovered Asakusa is an incredible neighborhood to base yourself in. It also has Sensoji Temple. It has a variety of shrines. It has a, a lively entertainment district, restaurants, tons of shops, because it's a major tourism site for Japanese to go to. Uh, you know, it's got a Hello Kitty shop now, even. 
and a Studio Ghibli store, a traditional craftsman. There's a whole museum on traditional crafts, and it's all for based around craftsmen in that part of Tokyo that are still doing stuff. It's a lot of great history over there, too. I know that all the cool literati back in the day, they used to hang out in the socks. Because that's where it was cheap to drink, oh, yeah. I think, right? Well, it's a poor neighborhood even today. Mm -hmm. And a lot of it was a slum neighborhood at one time uh, in the Meiji period and stuff. But uh, And it's also very used to people visiting because the temple has been a major pilgrimage site for over a thousand years. Uh, it's yeah, it's also, a u ubiquitous photo. Anytime you see, like, if you Google oh, image yeah. search Tokyo, that's like, that's... Tominari Monday. Yeah. <laughs> and it's a very low-key neighborhood. It's very welcoming to people. It's extremely accessible on uh, major uh, subway lines and not far from the Yamanote line. It's directly on the Ginza subway line, which connects you to a lot of hot spots in Tokyo. So it turned out to be a great blessing. So I always base myself there. And at the end of the day, when we're tired and we go back and we drop off whatever we picked up during the day and go for a walk to get something for dinner, we have a really pleasant neighborhood which to walk around in because the tourists are largely gone unless they're staying there. And it's the locals. They're out hitting a little izakaya. They're having a good time. They're going to the temple to pray after a day's work. Uh, very welcoming, very nice. Uh, it's also on the Sumitagawa, which is like a really cool river to be close to. So, so are you, Giles, are you, are you willing to uh, uh, divulge the name of the place that you stay at? Sure. It's a little place called Taito Ryokan, uh, T A I T O, and then Ryokan, Y R Y O K A N. You know, it's family run. One guy runs it. He speaks excellent English and lives there. And uh, yeah, Taito Ryokan, very easy to get to. Uh, and a place I would highly recommend. And do not expect the big fancy Ryokans you see in the books. Those are like luxury hot spring places. This is the type of old fashioned Ryokan that traveling salesmen would stay at. The construction workers working on the job might stay at. No frills. You know, they got showers, no tubs. You get your own room, though, right? You get your own room. Uh, and they have uh, one person room, two people rooms, three people rooms, and one four person room. Uh, so it's, and it's very comfortable. You sleep on a futon on tatami mats, no chairs. So you got to be willing to sleep on the floor. I went in Rome, right? Yeah. Yeah. I'm sure what people are interested in is like, well, that's great. Sounds like a wonderful place. But am I going to be able to go there? Like if you were to try and get there as an individual tourist today, uh, you wouldn't be allowed in, right? Right now, right. I, I, we're talking in June of 2022. Uh, you have to be part of a group and your tour is micromanaged. You can only go in certain places. Uh, and that's no fun. And no, no apparently, fun. it's like super <laughs> expensive to do that. I had a, I got some statistics. You know, as a result of Japan having closed itself down, um, the number of foreign visitors to Japan last year dropped to two hundred forty five thousand nine hundred, which was the lowest since nineteen sixty four. And the finger and the figure was actually ninety four percent below that of twenty twenty. Yeah. Um, and it's just it's it's just been a, a shock. There's a lot of lobbying on the part of businesses and whatnot to bring tourism back. Uh, a lot of people say, "Well, it's kind of nice not to have all the tourists around." Especially <laughs> if you pe talk to people in Kyoto, they think, "Wow, I can actually get the garden and not be overwhelmed by tour buses and megaphones and everything." But right. it's had this you know tremendously uh, terrible effect on the economy. Now, apparently, there's a Japanese election coming up in, was it July 10th? And people are saying that uh, until that time, it's like no one's making any big moves. But once uh, the party in power has its position of authority locked in, then they're going to feel a lot more free to, to open things up. But who knows? What, what have you heard? I just follow what's being said. And I'm figuring the elections put a, a, a pause on anything changing right uh 
my hope is that things start opening up. I understand caution, but you know, every time a new variant or something comes out, the Japanese catch it as fast as other countries because their own people are, are traveling and bring it in. Uh, they've done a marvelous job on keeping the infection rates down. Uh, I live in Alameda County, and in Alameda County, we're about the same infection rate as Tokyo. And Tokyo's got 14 and a half million people. We've got a couple hundred thousand or so. You know, we postponed your book to November. It had originally been, for this year, scheduled in August. And that proved to be a little too optimistic. Mm -hmm. um, even, I mean, figuring that even if they do open up for travel in the fall, people who are making plans, that's still not enough time for them to get all their act together. So yeah, we're hoping that if we release the book in November, uh, that by the time people say, well, I'm going to plan for trips in you know, April and May of next year, which are good travel times in, in, in Japan, uh, that the timing should be right. Enough time for them to get the book, make their planning, you know, do all that stuff. But, but I don't know. Well, in, in your research, did you find like uh, a lot of places were forced to close down because they weren't supported by the tourists or not as many as you would think? Not as many as I would think. And I think part of it is a lot of the businesses I have in the book are family run and they live at the place of business. They own it. So therefore they do not have to pay a lot of rent. They're not having to pay in a separate apartment and community and all the time. Uh, so it's a little bit easier for them to kind of weather things. And some of them have done the thing of which they do in Tokyo a lot. The place is 25 years old. Let's tear it down and rebuild it. And a lot of them have rebuilt their places with apartments that they're renting out. So they've got another income source. So a lot of the places are weathering it. I've had one place that did close down in Shibuya, which was run by a family, but they didn't live there and they didn't own the land. Uh, they were renters. Uh, so a couple of other places closed down because the owners wanted to retire and there was nobody to take over the business, even though the business had been around 150 years. Uh, but on the whole, not that many places have shut down for economic reasons. Yeah. You, you mentioned that a lot of the uh, locations and businesses in the book are family run. Is that something that is unique to Tokyo? It's pretty common throughout Japan. Uh, Part of the reason I had so many in the book is I made a point of finding businesses that have been around since before World War II, preferably before the 20th century. So I've got businesses that have been around 300 years, 400 years. Was that for any particular reason? I felt there would be less of a chance of them closing down. <laughs> in all honesty, that was one factor. Just <laughs> they're incredibly cool. Yeah. You know, there's there's right. like one company that does nothing but brooms and brushes you know uh there was one company that did eyeglasses but unfortunately they closed down and they were the, the eyeglass makers for the imperial family but people were not going in and getting custom fitted eyeglass frames anymore i was actually planning to go in with my prescription and order a, a pair and have the frames made because they they build they physically build the frame for your head and my head's large, so these things tend to gouge in the side a lot. Uh, so, but there's other incredible little shops that have just survived and survived and survived. I've got clothing stores. I've got bookstores. I've got a map store. I've got shops of all sorts of specialties at traditional crafts, woodblock printmakers, uh, things that are relatively modern, uh, you know, historical coffee shops. Uh, you know, all sorts of things and architecture. You know, I tried to cover as many things, of course, temples and shrines and parks and museums and everything. And, and all that stuff is, uh, I mean, the book is all organized by neighborhood and there's maps everywhere. Uh, tell us a little bit about what you did with the maps and the, uh, the online feature that you've built into it. Okay. Basically, what I did with the maps is I took all the locations I was interested in. 
found them on Google Maps, did screen captures, printed them out, annotated them, figured out which geographical areas could be formed as a chapter, because each chapter is a neighborhood. And so I had like a nice stack of those. Some things tended to be too spread out, so they did not get included in the book. And so each chapter has, there's 22 chapters, each chapter has an area map, and then there's detail maps, because the goal was to have the detail maps so detailed that you would know that the shop I'm looking for is four buildings from the corner. Who the heck can read all the kanji and kana that's tourist? Especially since these things are like really nice, fancy calligraphy. You know, you really got to know your stuff to do that. And especially in Tokyo, where everything is so condensed. I mean, yeah. sometimes a building can... I mean, you look at a sign and there's... I mean, not only uh, vertically, but horizontally. Yes. Five floors up in the basement. It, it's uh, mm-hmm. cra- It can be very overwhelming. Yeah, I've got some... Uh, cases in which there's five different shops and they're in one building. You know, uh, in Akihabara, I got, I got one like that. Uh, and so, you know, I, I tell the people in the book, look vertical. You know, what you're looking for is not going to be on the ground level. Like recently, I had a conversation with a guy online because he was recommending some shops in Jimbo Cho that were bookstores that also sold Japanese prints. And I said, yeah, but there's three great print shops. They sell traditional woodblock prints, but they're all on the second and third floors. And you're not going to spot them by just wandering back and forth, you know? I was, yeah, definitely guilty of that on my first trip. I mean, only because, for one, it's kind of intimidating, like you mentioned, all this kanji. And I mean, there's so many, there's so much signage, but yeah, there are, I mean, it almost seems like whole worlds to explore if you just (laughs) venture up to the second or third floor. One of the things I mentioned in the book is if you're getting sensory overload in a major shopping area like Akihabara, walk two or three blocks down a side street. It'll be so quiet, you'll be surprised. The activity is condensed, and then it spreads out. And so the book was kind of designed for people who want to say, okay, I'm interested in such and such. I'll go to that neighborhood, and I'll just kind of wander around. I do not have a start at point A, go to point B, go to point C. No, no. You've got the map. It's got all the streets. It's got the the pedestrian pathways. And it's got the numbers for the things and descriptions of what each number is for. You just wander. Take your time. Get off the map. Get lost. But if you do, if you do want to follow along on a map with your GPS or something, you can, you can do that, right? Yeah. Now, the thing I've done is, there's an application that I'm recommending in the book uh, called Maps Me. It's a mapping application that is not dependent upon a digital connection. You don't have to be on the internet. You don't have to be paying extra digital fees. And you can be way out in the boonies where you don't have that cell phone digital connection and still have a functioning map. The book, Tokyo Stroll, all of these locations, there will be a pre-existing Maps Me, what is it, document or something that you can download? Uh, actually, I, yeah, you download the app application and you install it on either your smartphone or your tablet. It's not a computer application, smartphones and tablets. Then you download the maps, the maps for the Kanto area where Tokyo is. Then on the supplement website for the book, I have files that you can then download and import into Maps Mm. Me, which are bookmarks. And And we'll have this on the Stonebridge website as well. Yeah. So, for example... So, you said they're color-coded? They're Mm color-coded. Mm-hmm. So, I've got one color for things in the book, which is the green. I've got purple, which is useful things. And then there's another set, which is red, which are things which are on the online supplement that I'm building. Each color is a separate set of bookmarks. So you can only, you can turn on one or two or all of them if you want. Mm. And then you can have your own bookmarks to mark places that you're interested in visiting. And if you've got a tablet that doesn't have GPS, it's okay. You've still got a great map. You just have to 
Pay, you just have to keep track of where you are. Yeah. yeah, which isn't that hard. Yeah, well, that sounds brilliant. And uh, yeah, so so you get the book and then you uh, you download it. And the, the app is free, right? The app is free. The maps are free. Of course, I don't charge anything for the uh, the bookmarks. And you can also import the bookmarks into Google Maps if you prefer. But they lose the color coding. They're all going to be the same color. You know, so uh, that's me I, is, is the one I recommend. And the neighborhoods you cover, they're all around the city, right? I mean, it's yeah, not, they're in, yeah. in what's called the 23 Ku area, which is right. the part of Tokyo that is the oldest part. One of the reasons for that is there's a lot of things in close proximity. So there have to be a certain density. Yeah, I would love to have done some things out in Western Tokyo, but God, things are separated by miles. You'd be taking a bus here, a bus there type of thing. Yeah, I, I guess the, the idea is you, you you go to one place, then you start strolling, right? Yes. Yeah, you start yeah. walking around. So some of the things that people, I, I mean, you can probably find this information on just about any kind of tourist site, but let's just touch on them briefly. Things that people worry about. Let's list three. Cost, use of language being understood, and then personal safety. So uh, take those in order, uh, cost. People think, well, Tokyo is really expensive. True or not true? Not true. I typically tell people when I do presentations, okay, I'm super tight-fisted. I'm really tight-fisted. I'll pinch, I'll pinch every penny I can. I typically tell people I spend about $2,800 for a three-week trip, including airfare. That's unbelievable. My friend Stephen, who's been with me on almost all the trips, told me once I was lying because he said he's never spent more than twenty five hundred on essentials. Okay, okay. The place we're staying at only recently up their rates, but it's three thousand yen a night. It's less than thirty bucks a night per person. Okay, airfare out of SFO round trip nonstop eleven hundred to twelve hundred dollars. Then you got your local transit. You, there's a smart card you can buy. There's two smart cards you can buy. They're interchangeable, and you can get one at the airport. Put a bunch of cash on it and you beep yourself in. You don't have to worry about change and buying ticket machines and all that for transportation, uh, which helps on the communication front. And transportation is relatively inexpensive. You're staying in Tokyo. You might do a day trip to Enoshima or you know Yokohama or something, but largely in Tokyo. And, you know, then your meals. Restaurants are not that expensive in Tokyo. You can get a good breakfast for seven, eight bucks. You know, you can get a good, you know, meal for like 10 to $15. Uh, it's much cheaper than here. I realized, so, too, on my first trip, 7-Eleven, Family Mart, the food mm -hmm. is fantastic. I mean, oh, you yeah. think coming from the States where the food is abysmal, it, it, you know, those kind of places, but... Sushi, you know, fried food that they have, it's really great. Yeah, yeah, you can get bentos. Sometimes they'll heat them up for you. All sorts of wonderful sandwiches. Ooh, strawberry and cream sandwiches. <laughs> you know, <laughs> things like that. Uh, great stuff. I'll leave those to you. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, there's a, there's a dietary rule that uh, when you go to Japan, if it doesn't, if it's not something you're allergic to, it's okay. <laughs> you know, go for it. <laughs> but the uh, other thing is, you know, that's the cost factor. You know, it keeps it really low. I always tell people bring plenty of extra uh, in your budget because you're going to want to buy gifts for people. You're going to want to buy gifts for yourself. You know, you're going to find cool things. You might want to go to the theater. That's going to cost you more. Uh, you know, you, museums are not bad. There's a passbook you can get for about 25 bucks to get you free or heavily discounted admission and 91 museums in the greater Tokyo area. So, and of course, you're never going to use that sucker up, uh, even if you live museum to museum and the entire trip, which would be kind of awesome. Uh, then, uh, so, you know, cost wise. And uh, okay, so let's then let's talk about language and getting understood. You, you said the uh, the guy runs the uh, uh, Yokan that where you stayed. He spoke uh, he spoke English. Yeah, excellent English. Uh, but when you're going to a lot of places, a lot of these people are not going to speak English. Don't sweat it. I tend to recommend people go to mom and pop restaurants. Uh, they're not going to speak English. They're going to be incredibly helpful and informal. 
The chain restaurants uh, have English menus. There's another thing that some restaurants have, which is a machine by the door where you have a, a, a touch screen or a, a bunch of buttons with entrees portrayed next to them and the cost. And the touchscreen ones ha are multilingual. So you put your money in, you choose what you want, you put your money in, you get a ticket. The waiter or waitress doesn't have to know how to speak to you. They know what you want. You know, you take your change, you sit down, you're up and rolling. And most of uh, the uh, transportation signs, uh, uh, in the subways, trains, buses, and whatnot, they have uh, at least the English station signs. and Yeah. Yeah, there's uh, romanized lettering, so the station names and everything. The uh, there's usually a little on um, bus lines. There's a, a kind of a schematic map, like we're familiar with in the, in the urban area in America, with the Japanese name and then the romanized version under it. So you can figure, oh yeah, I can just take this and get off at su such and such. And if you get off one stop too early or one stop too late, yeah, you're still in Tokyo wandering around having, yeah, having yeah. fun. Okay, 2007, first night. We've done this 11-hour flight. I had been organized, had a detailed list of each step we would have to go through to the airport, you know, immigration, customs, you know, picking up the luggage, uh, changing our cash into yen. And I highly recommend people bring a pile of money to ca cash at the airport right away. Don't do it here. You're going to pay extra fees here and not get as good an exchange rate as well at the airport in Japan. I typically bring about a grand and just hand it to them and they t tally it up on an adding machine, show you what it's going to be. You sign a paper to give you the cash because uh, you're going to need cash immediately. And the small shops often operate on a cash basis. They don't do credit cards. So we got there. We caught the express train in from Narita. We went into the Ueno station, found a subway took the subway to Taramachi. It's dark. You know, sun, the sun has gone down. We'd have no idea what direction is what. But I have a printed out map. So I say, okay, I think if we go this way, there's going to be a Koban, according to the printout I have. So we're walking along, and I say, well, I think we've gone too far. Well, the Koban was on a corner, and it was beveled, so we walked right past it. And the Koban is a, it's like a police box. It's a police yeah, station, right? Exactly. It's a police box, and one of their duties is to give directions. And they have a marvelous system by which if they don't have somebody at the Koban who speaks English, and a lot of them these days do, they will call somebody up, and that person on the phone will be an interpreter. So they're, they're very helpful. So we were about three quarters of a block further on. And I said, I'm going to ask somebody, okay, this is late night. Almost everybody in the street is local residents and they're in pairs. They're couples usually. I see one guy by himself and I hold up the map and I say, uh, uh, excuse me, sinimasen, taito ryokai. He spoke English. We understood every single word. So he gave us directions. He said, ah, yes, it's back that way, you know, and so forth and everything. He says, he said, first time to Japan? I said, well, first time for me and my friend Cindy, and uh, second time for Stephen. And, uh, you know, so he wel welcomed us and said, have a good time. And we're walking back. And this goes into the safety thing. <laughs> I look at my friends. I said, let me get this clear. Middle-aged guy, loud shirt, little earring, short hair, tight perm. And they're going, yeah, why? And I said, we just got directions from a local gangster. <laughs> <laughs> I had a student worker who was from Asakusa. So I asked him about this when I got back, and he said, oh, yeah, yeah, there's it's, it's a couple of gangs there, and they work heavily with the pachinko partners and stuff, and they will not mess with you, because if they mess with you, it creates a bad image, and that can hurt their income. If they mess with you, their boss will literally beat them up. <laughs> so, very safe. Yeah, so, and the, the other thing about the safety, it's dense, lots of people, tons of witnesses. So, if somebody's going to call some, start something. People aren't necessarily going to step in and help you, but they got cell phones, 
they'll be taking pictures, they'll be filming, they'll be calling the cops. Uh, but, but generally, I, I think people are not accosted on the street. They're not oh, hassled. God, no. You may get touts trying to, you know, approach you and trying to get you to come into their club, but you ignore not somebody, you walk, you walk by. <laughs> I mean, you're kind of left to, your, left to your own devices. Yeah, yeah. The touts aren't, don't do that as much these days because the police crack down on it, which is a drag. <laughs> that was yeah. part of the local color. Well, anyway, so... Uh, so Tokyo is uh, it's affordable. You can you can get around. You can make yourself understood, and it's a safe place to go. So, except for the Japanese government saying you can't come here, uh, right. everyone should be ma- making plans. Let's wind up, uh, Giles, and maybe you could pick like uh, three don't miss places if 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 you go. What, what what would you think would be the top of your list? You go to Tokyo and. And they don't have to be in the Asakusa area. I mean, they could be like anywhere. Where, where do you think? Yeah, what are your I've, already, three I've already mentioned Asakusa, so I'll keep that off the list uh, as far as description. If you're into current anime and manga related things, go to Akihabara. If you're into older shows, go to Nakano Broadway Mall. Uh, the uh, Mandarake has some great shops there, and there's other great shops. And that's just it's, west of Shinjuku, right? Yeah, yeah, it's yeah. just a few train stops west of Shinjuku. Uh, nice area. Uh, got some great places to eat. The Ningyo Cho is a wonderful old neighborhood with one of the highest densities of old shops in Japan. It's one of the original neighborhoods from when the city of Edo was founded. Uh, Ningyo means doll. And it's a neighborhood that has a lot of craftspeople. In the old days, the Kabuki Theater and the Puppet Theaters were in that area. And therefore, they got a lot of artisans who were doing stuff for those theaters. Uh, if you like checking out department stores, not necessarily buying things. The department stores themselves, in and of themselves, are cool artifacts. Nihonbashi north of the river, Nihonbashi south of the river, and then the Ginza district. It's all on the big row. And... Uh, I once gave my friend Stephen a tour. He had no interest in going to the Ginza. And I said, listen, there's interesting architecture. Let's go there before they open. So we took the train down to Nihambashi, and we started at the Nihambashi Bridge and worked our way south, just starting just before sunrise. And then we zigzagged through the back alleys and streets. And by then, I had maps me on my iPad. Otherwise, it could not have done this. Lots of tiny little Shinto shrines, little bar districts where you could not go into the bar unless you had an introduction from another customer. You know, uh, these are, you know, the traditional, more expensive places. Uh, Interesting architecture on the main street, little delightful things like a statue of a little putti that could have come out of a Renaissance Italian painting. Little tiny sets are looking around the corner, uh, you know, and we just zigzagged throughout the entire neighborhood. And by the time we got through, it was about three and a half, four hours later. And then we just walked over to the Sakiji area near the old fish market, had uh, lunch, and then we continued on for the day. So those are a couple of the neighborhoods, that whole area. But the department stores themselves are worth checking out because some of them have roof gardens uh, on top. And a Japanese department store is not like one company. They often will rent out sections to other retailers. So it's more like a vertical mall. The other thing I would say is not necessarily, again, not necessarily a specific location, but find out what festivals are going on. And I'm building a very large chart for festivals and events on my website. So you can figure out in May, we've got this, this, and this. Uh, or every Sunday at this shrine, there's a flea market or, you know, so forth. And so you can figure out what events are going on and go experience those, you know, which are kind of cool. And then for locations, uh, Ueno Park is great. If it's a rainy day, it has a very large selection of museums. Uh, if you're over 65, the Science Museum is free. You just show the guy at the turnstile your passport. 
<laughs> that's it. Uh, I could go on and on, actually, well beyond your yeah. uh, three places. So. Right. There was one location that I was showed um, by a group of friends in Tokyo and that you had posted about, and I think it's a hidden gem that I always recommend people go to, and it's Todoroki Valley. Ah, yes, yes. I don't have that in the book, but it will be in the supplement because that, that part of Tokyo, things are tended to be more spread out. It is, um, yeah. Yeah. In the supplement, I have a web page for each chapter with additional things that are not in the book, things I found about more recently or were slightly off the maps. And and uh, like I said, I have a set of bookmarks for those supplement items. And I'm going to start a second set of pages that are going to include neighborhoods that are not in the book. Otoku, N- the Nakano area, uh, you know, Ikebukuro. You know, and then way out west and in, in more in the Tama area and stuff where they have some great new little spots and things. Uh, and I'll be kind of puttering those around. Great. Well, so uh, I, I hope every, everyone who's listening to this is inspired to uh, make their plans to, to go to Tokyo. And uh, you can start by getting a hold of Giles' book. It's going to be available uh, in November, but uh, it will be up for pre-sale on Amazon and other online places before then. By all means, check with your local bookseller. Tell them to get with it and you know start ordering Japan travel books, including Giles, and there's some other very good books uh, you can get too. Um, Giles' book is going to be available as a print book and as an e-book, and it's going to have lots of photos, lots of maps. It's going to have this map me uh, uh, thing to help you navigate around when you're there, so there's no reason not to get it and check out Giles's website which you can get to at uh, www.koyagi.com and there's yes. a link to not just the Tokyo Stroll updates but to all the other things that Giles has information about lots of stuff on uh, Japanese culture Japanese animation Giles has been doing this for years so there's a tons and tons of information there check it out everybody thanks a lot Giles it's been great talking to you okay thank you to find out more about Stonebridge Press and our books and authors, go to www.stonebridge.com. You can find our substack, The Stone Bridge, at stonebridgepress.substack.com. And you can visit and message us on Twitter at, at Stonebridge Pub or on Facebook at Stonebridge Press. So reach us by regular email, write to us at spp at stonebridge.com.